This is called Firefly Nights, so it's the very first poem, the, the beginning of the almanac in the book. June, stay a while. Linger with me until the last bloom on the basswood tree withers and bees move on to Bergamo. I'll see you in the jars of cherry jam, the memories of first potatoes and toes in cold lake waters. And later, in December, when it's hard to remember what is now or real, when I look to the night sky above the frosted field to seek Orion's steady guidance, I will hold the after images of sparks in the night above each creek and stream, arteries of fireflies, glittering rivers of light. I love the, the visual parts of poems too, because I use a lot of different rhyme throughout. And sometimes you need to see it and sometimes you need to hear it. It isn't you know, lined up in a particular way. Uh, I'm going to go to Stippled Passing, which is, that's the end of summer, page 27. How many of you know the poetry of Gerard Manley Hopkins? You know it, yeah. Uh, there's Pied Beauty, and there's that line in Pied Beauty. Oh, if you don't know Pied Beauty, you have to find it. The rose moles stippled on the back of a trout that swim. It has to do with the rose moles and stippling. And so that's how this whole poem came to be. And when it was published by the journal that it was in, they said, we love this poem. They nominate it for a pushcart. And they said, but we don't understand it. I said, I don't understand it either, but it, there's something going on there that's a connection. Stippled passing. You could see the gilding beneath those stippling waters, the speckles of a trout's back, sleek and slipping along golden gravel, shadowed stream banks among grassy striations of summer's heat passing. You may have wanted eternal summer, that moment so perfect with mint-lined streams, trees unwilling to give up their green. But if time stood still, sun in brassy sky steadily beaming, you would turn, seek the shift to bronze, to that time of deciduous rain. You would seek crimson's run, fill the baskets with round, sweet apples, and let the pigments of the roseate world drain. Let be. Release your hold on the season. You may no longer see the gold pearled beneath the rippled stream. Gold in water is fleeting flash, memory's after image. Creek waters and sun roll on. Hidden along the stream's ledge, trout sleep, dream. Sweet land of liberty. I live on a farm. I live in a house with some renewable energy. Um, it's a beautiful house. I live with wood heat. There's no petrol in our house. There's no petrol on any of the surfaces. So I'm lost in my beautiful bubble of my home. It's a beautiful place. And look out over the stream and I can hear the spring and the waters bubbling all the time. But I forget sometimes about the rest of the world. And I am, uh, I used to be an ethnic folk dance performer. I used to do a lot of performance. And um, my friends tend to be around the world. Some of them left the United States a few years ago. And um, in 2016, some of them came back for a visit, but it was set at Devil's Lake State Park. And I don't know if you know anything about Devil's Lake State Park, but it is the place all the people from Chicago come to if they're going to come to a state park in Wisconsin because it's in the Baraboo Hills. It's very beautiful. Huge, huge hills that you can climb up these rocks and go around and down both ends of the lake. But it gets really crowded and I would never go there. So here you are, sweet land of liberty. At Devil's Lake, 
the busiest state park in Wisconsin on the 4th of July, a place I would never go, and never at this peak time, but for a reunion with expats. The long line of cars entering along Park Road is at a standstill, like the bathroom lines where we strangers chat as we stand waiting, part of a summer picnic tapestry. Clusters of families dot the beach lawn in shade and sun, grilling a million meals. Languages from every continent coo to babies and strollers, laugh as frisbees fly, and I am at home in my country, this America, the diverse place I cannot see from my farm kitchen window. High above the lake, I trudge the rocky trails. Hives of families climb, apologize in an array of accents when I step aside to let them pass. I am surprised by their humble politeness, as if I'm not just another American born of immigrants. Back down at the bottom, the lines of the broken bathroom wrap around the building, while mothers merge to help each other's children take a drink of clean water, reassure them that we're all safe together. In our group around the picnic blanket, we are world travelers. I ask one who's been to Turkey, Iran, Turkmenistan, if she feels safe in those places. She assures me she does. She tells me people everywhere are so much alike and want the same thing, to have picnics together with their families. On this day of celebrating our nation, I wonder where our elected officials have taken their picnics and if they believe in the gatherings of families in public places. For one day, I am in the real America, a place where everyone can freely play together as everything crumbles. I love swallows, and you'll find out why in a little bit. Um, but I love swallows, and in this book, we have a progression of swallows. This is the third section of the book. Uh, and Heartbreak and Beauty is about farm life. I've been doing it for 34 years, but actually I've been doing it my whole 64 years because where I grew up, all the old people had fruit trees and bushes and their whole yard was food. And I loved that. And I was sad that my parents' generation gave it up and they gave up canning. So I picked it up and I did it. I'm going to go to the first part in that section, page 39. And Obad is a, a poem to greet the dawn, usually after lovers part. If you're a farmer milking, Obad has a completely different meaning. Obad for the never ending flow of milk. There were the days of goats and goats and milking our Nubian goats, holding them in place to help their kids latch. Come on, latch! While we praised them, stroked their noses and long, lovely ears. There were the sleepless nights of rising to the call of a kid caught in a fence, or the pleading calls of our does frightened by predators, sounding for all the world like abandoned elders in a nursing home, or the murmured call of the buck professing his love throughout the neighborhood from his separate pasture across the road. There were nights our children dozed deep, dreaming the sleep of the milk sated while we in freezing February waited and waited for another kid to drop needing our help and the next milking at dawn. I'm gonna do a very brief farm poem. Page 44, it's about my rural neighborhood. Across Wisconsin people, are their artist selves, they can't help it. Some people would call them eccentric. They're just artists, all of us are artists, every single one of us. And so um, sometimes surprising things happen and this poem goes really fast, so here we go. Hang with me. It's called Art Goes Unbidden, page 44. Art goes unbidden among my rural neighbors, the ones who've always been here. Strange ideas come from those who've never left their home place, who wish to make their mark. The man who tries to arrange his woodpile so the logs of dark 
red elms spell out his name amid lighter splits of ash and oak. Uncalled for. Art shows up. Patsy and Robbie, would you come read? When I was four years old, I wanted to read so badly. I wanted to eat words. And I asked my parents to teach me how to read. And they said, no, you have to go to school for that. So then I went to school. I got to kindergarten. I got all excited. But kindergarten in those days, that was 1963. Kindergarten in those days meant we had to learn how to line up. And we had to get sticks we beat against one another for rhythm, learning rhythm things. And we used big, thick crayons. And we colored. And um, i trying to think of what else we did. We put on aprons. Yeah, we probably did some finger painting even. And that was it. Maybe we went through the alphabet. So I had to wait to first grade. First grade, 1964. I had uh, an Irish teacher. And I had 45, 44 classmates. There were 45 of us in first grade. And so, and this wasn't in the country, this was in the city. And so um, we had a series called Alice and Jerry. Did you know Alice and Jerry? Oh, I loved it. And there were manila cards with the high frequency words, the sight words. And so the teacher would put them up and we would learn a series of them in a week and then we would read in the book. And so it was just memorizing, memorizing words, learning how to pronounce things. But a lot of these words, you couldn't use your, your sounding out, your phonetics. And then after a month of this, there was another teacher and our class got split and I went with Miss Robinson. And what I remember in my heart so deeply is that one day I had a two syllable word and I remember what it was, river. That was my first two syllable word. And I've been involved with rivers ever since and I can't give them up. So uh, this is called baptism. Beyond the placards of words that cover the first grade varnished desk, this, that, he, she, it, is, are, was, were, two syllables float into view. River. River! You speak them. Teacher smiles and nods on all at once. You can see, yes, the stream of words as it joins another and another. And the waters rise. They rise, yes. And you hear rapids while your lips push out words, cascading, sweeping you down one torrent to another, surging as current courses through you. Words pour, propel you forward. You shiver as the spray hits. Waters sweep classroom away. Your desk becomes a gleaming wood canoe. And just as you wonder how you'll steer this craft. Teacher holds out your paddle. You plunge it in, dip and pull. S stroke, J stroke, feather forward, dip and pull. For a moment you turn back, raise your paddle in salute to. Teacher as she waves from the far, far shore. <laughs> Parallelogram, um, page 71. I love writing um, to artwork, ecrastic writing, seeing a painting, being inspired by it, writing something, let it inspire whatever it does. There was a, a photograph of people, probably in an airport in black and white, and above them were these huge windows that were all parallelograms, the way that the windows were trussed. And through the windows, you could see that there was snow on the ground and bare trees. But you saw these people almost like shadows in front of the parallelograms. And so that brought up a lot of things in me. I love symbolic language like mathematics. I love maps, but I really get lost in maps. And there is a real world out there, and um, I think Sometimes our world just gets lost in the maps and the geometry and doesn't consider that there are connections and relationships we need to pay attention to more in ecology. Mm -hmm. So here we are, a parallelogram. 
A parallelogram consists of two lines equidistant. We are spectator and observed, reflected in each other's eyes. When you wake, I sleep beneath skies charted in an ever-expanding universe on a globe of lines and crossings, and I wonder what grid I must cross to reach you in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, or at which degree of longing your heart beats. The world is divided, the sky a satellite net of impulses, but stars still shine like diamonds. I could tell you that winter here is cold and gray, and you could say that sand is brown, but it's not. In each crystal of silica or frozen drop of water, prisms lie within. We are composed of rainbows arching across horizons, reaching beyond rectangles and maps. Come to my desert. We could wait for melt, share cups of mint tea, and recall all lines are imaginary. All geometry, all plans, just ideas. Look instead to the trees. Like rivers, like our capillaries, they root and branch, knitting the heart of light and dark into curves of longing. I want you to know about this. I, um, I created a poem after we had severe floods where I live. It wiped out one town and the town had to move, but we've had floods over and over and they get more and more severe. And the truth is, in, in those particular floods, I'll just tell you how bad they were. It was 20 inches of rain in one night and it was a swath of um, 40 miles north to south, 120 miles east to west. So it hit southeastern Minnesota across to central Wisconsin, almost southern Wisconsin. And it was devastating <laughs> between our two creeks below our house. It was a lake and we've lost our road before. We were lucky this time that we could still walk out. Um, we had vehicles on the other side. But I think about how we just keep picking things up. And as farmers, we just keep picking things up. As citizens, we just keep picking things up. We keep going, we keep working for the world because we care. I feel that um, we need to get more art in our lives through poetry, through spoken word, through written word, through visual arts, um, sculpture, dance, whatever. I think we just need to do that because we're human beings. And I feel like we connect ourselves to place more when we tell our stories through any of these. Uh, and we help one another by doing that. And a few years ago, I felt the need to write this poem and make it into a piece of art. I worked with an artist to create this poster poem. I took donations and had it printed up. Wherever I go, I take donations. I have batches printed up. I have lots of posters right now to hand out because I am determined to cover the state of Wisconsin in this because I feel that if we celebrate where we live, we will protect it. That's a really important piece. And so on the bottom of the poster, it encourages people to look at this and find something they love. I'm just going to tell you flat out what I love. Stephanie Motts, an artist from Madison, put water beings on here. She knows that I'm a water person. She put water beings and they're seeding life energy down to the bottom. And there's a river or a lake at the bottom and rocks. I insisted on that. And um, so everything flows in this poem. Um, so what I want you to know is that I am giving it out. If you want to take one or more, you have a place to put it up, this building for one, please do that. Hand it out to a school, hand it out somewhere in the community. If it would stick on lampposts and not get wet, I'd say put it on the lamppost. But my goal is for people to read it and see if there's something they love in it. If you see something you love in it, write, draw, do something, um, send me a note. I'd like to hear from people across the state. And I think when things get dreadful in our state, we just need to keep celebrating and reminding ourselves what's important. Invocation, call it home. 
to this place, Wisconsin, the gathering of waters, we bind ourselves, call it home. Through seasons droughty and wild, we marvel at our inability to tame weathers or waters. We cannot leave the river. When she roars, we call her fickle, follow her trail of flotsam, just the same as stumping behind a maladjusted baler flinging hay beyond the rick. We pick up what's tossed only to come back and try again. Like caddis fly larvae in spring creeks, cobbling homes of gravel and spit, hunkering in cold and wet, we wait for that ripe, glorious May afternoon to soar. We are does, listening for danger, watching for the swing of the antlers that lift and set us in flight. Coyotes howl at the edges, hungry for spoils we won't share. Our caches of dried morels, flagons of maple syrup. Ours is a king's lair. We call this land home because we are here. We wish for nothing more than pie in summer, painting woodcocks in spring, spiraling over fields where turkeys fan, gravy in fall wood-fired winters. Therefore, let us bless these streams with rod and creel, these fields with trowel and seed. Fill our bellies with berry and cream and brim our hearts full. A passerine is a perching bird, of which a swallow is one. But I'm talking here about my own passing. <laughs> um, in my afterlife, I want to be a swallow. And one of the hardest decisions I've had to make is what kind of swallow. Do I want to be a bank swallow? Do I want to live under bridges? Do I want to go back to the Apostle Islands and live at Raspberry Island on the Lighthouse Foghorn Signal Building? where the swallows would make their nests under the eaves? Or do I want to stay where I am in the barn? Barn swallow. I'm going to be a barn swallow. <laughs> Passerine. When my time is over, if I were to choose, I told my children, in the next life I would be a swallow. Swoop from sky to ground, scoop mud up in my beaked place on the barn rafter. I'd build a shallow shelf a dish nest of dry adobe, a token of loyalty to my family, not to last forever after, but to hold on only as long as the life will last in the barn, shelter for so very unseen many. And on the shelf, I would keep my nestlings, sweep the air for food to feed my beak open young, show them when fledging how to leap and trust air to hold their future and leave at the golden, fat, blooming season of sunflower. Fly far, find adventure, sail home in spring on waves of apple blossom and first sweet clover. I'd choose swallow when my time is over. <laughs>